Check. Check, check. Can you hear me now? Even though my microphone was turned off. Even though my microphone was. All right, I think it's working now. My goodness, I have been talking. Man, I've been talking for. <laughs> I've been talking for almost 10 minutes, and it ain't even. Oh, uh, let me go back. It's all right. Let me go back. All right, let me go back. So, Second Peter. All right, we're gonna keep going. Second Peter. Let's see. So, dealing with Second Peter, we're gonna see that Peter, in this epistle, this letter, sounds totally different than what he wrote in First Peter. And uh, epistle, you'll hear the term epistle. Epistle is just a genre or a type of literature in the Bible. Epistle, letter, they're the same thing. And so we're going to see that the purpose here in 2 Peter, the purpose here in 2 Peter is Peter is going to encourage believers, encourage us to grow in our godliness. And that's what it's all about. Growing in godliness, growing in Christ's likeness. He's going he's gonna to show us that we have the opportunity to participate in the divine nature. And that's what we're going to be studying uh, this morning. The first 11 verses, getting, uh, becoming more like Christ. The value of true prophecy. Uh, the danger of false teachers and the immoral behavior in chapter 2. And then the truth that Christ is going to return, that Christ is going to return, and that is in chapter 3. So we see the author is Peter uh, set in Rome mid to uh, early to the mid-60s. The theological themes, the theological themes is uh, scripture and prophecy and how Scripture has was inspired, and how holy men wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But then we're going to see prophecy. We have a more sure word of prophecy, and that is what is given to us in the Word of God. Then he's going to deal with the return of Christ, the return of Christ, that second coming of Christ, literally physically to the earth to rule and to reign and then sanctification. The return of Christ, knowing that he is coming back, is what motivates sanctification for us. Becoming more and more holy, Christ-like, that is what motivates our sanctification. And so the big idea here in chapter 1 is that God has graciously allowed us to participate in his divine nature. And we're going to talk about that. That doesn't mean we become like God. That is not what that means. We, we're going to get to that in just a second. Uh, therefore, we must diligently work to grow into this reality and to be assured of our calling by God. And so we're going to look in these first 11 verses Peter's going to give us these, these seven key virtues that's going to give us the assurance that we're saved and we know God by becoming like him. We know God by becoming like him. All right, so now we're all caught up. Sorry about that technical difficulties in the beginning. Now let's get into the word open your bibles i invite you to come to second peter chapter 1 second peter chapter 1 now right off the bat i want us to notice and this is 
This is a good skill in what we call observation. We notice in Second Peter, in First Peter. So if we go to First Peter, chapter one, verse one, in this salutation, this is what's called a salutation or an opening. He is just simply called Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Notice that chapter one of First Peter, he's Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, when we go to 2 Peter, notice what's added. Simon Peter, Simon Peter, a doulos, a slave, and an apostolos, a, a, a sent one, a, a, an envoy, one who is carrying a message of um, Jesus Christ. So notice he's adding Simon Peter. He, he adds Simon to it, and he's going to add doulos as well. So that's a good thing to, to mark, to underline, to observe. So Peter is writing this letter later in his life, and, and he uses his, his Hebrew, his name at birth, Simon, and then Peter is the name that God gave to him, that Jesus gave to him in Matthew. And so Peter is, he, he, he could be, he, he didn't want to forget where he came from. And that sometimes he's a little like the old Simon than the new Peter. And so we're going to see that you know, First Peter was written to encourage Christians who are going through violent persecution. Second Peter is written to warn those same believers of the dangers of false teachers and harmful influences. And so I want to tell right off the bat, the best antidote, jot this down if you're taking notes. If you're taking notes, write this down, that the best antidote, <coughs> excuse me, the best antidote for heresy is a mature knowledge of the truth, that Christian faith that has been handed down to us. Don't forget that. Take note. We're going to see that the best antidote for heresy in combating false teachers is a mature knowledge of the truth. You have to go deeper than just the, knowing the Ten Commandments and Jesus loves me. This I know. You have to mature in your faith. You have to grow in your faith. You have to get deeper into the meat of the word of God. And so then notice now the order of these titles. The order is important. He calls himself a doulos and then an apostolos of Jesus Christ. A bondservant, a doulos. Paul, uh, Peter calls himself a doulos first, one who is an, uh, is an obedient, one who is a follower of the king. Peter thought of himself first as a servant of Christ. And this is where humility plays a part. You know, some people won't acknowledge you unless you address them by their titles. Peter says, yes, I'm an apostle, but first I am a slave of Jesus Christ, a bond servant. And it's interesting that Peter calls himself a servant, which contrast the false teachers in chapter two who want to greedily exploit people in their bold and arrogant insubordination. So Peter, right off the bat, teaches us humility. 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 He says, then I am an apostle. And notice that Peter's standing as a bond servant, as a doulos, was more important to him 
than his status as an apostle. Is that true about you? Is that true about us? That we consider our standing as being bond servants of Christ more important than any status that we can have. Type of one, type of one, if you're glad just to be a servant of Jesus Christ. Type of one, if you're glad just to be a servant of Jesus Christ, you could have no other titles but just to be considered and to be called a servant. That's enough. That's enough for me. So then he goes on to say, through the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter now says, you know, yes, you're elect. You know, in chapter one, they were the elect exiles. But now he says, you are the recipients. We are the recipients of a precious faith through the righteousness of God. Through the righteousness of God. He said, this is a precious faith. Now, this word, uh, like ours, a like precious faith, this is one of um, the same, you have equal standing. Jew and Gentile now have equal standing in the faith. And then this faith was obtained not by the efforts of man, but by the righteousness of God. And so right here, he's introducing another theme of faith, that, that faith has to be grown into and guarded. Your faith that we have, has that me and you have, has to be guarded and grown into. It has to be guarded and grown into. And notice he says you have the same kind of faith. By the righteousness of our God, to theu kai Iesu Christu, our Soteras, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now this is what is called, this right here is an explicit statement of the deity of Jesus Christ. And this is what's called the, uh, the Granville Sharp Rule, where two, two words or titles here, names, are used with one article, two, and it's, it's referring to the same person. So the God and the Savior is Jesus Christ. There's not two different people he's speaking of. It's one. And so this is the strongest affirmation of the deity of Christ. Peter uses one article in Greek, two, tau, omicron, upsilon, cru, uh, two, to show that God and Savior refers to the same person, which is Jesus. And then in verse 2, the Father and the Son are referred to separately. And so you get into the, the, the Trinity here and things like that. But this is, this is an amazing, amazing point. So we have precious faith that God has given to you, believing Gentiles, the same faith and salvation that he has given to what well, Paul says, us, the believing Jews. Jesus Christ, Peter says here, is our God and our Savior. Our God and our Savior. Peter is calling Jesus both God and Savior. Don't miss that. Peter is calling Jesus, both God and Savior. Now, let's get into this. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the full knowledge of our of God and of our Jesus, of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us 
everything pertaining to life and godliness, you see bias. Through the full knowledge, the epigenosis of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. So Paul says the key to a godly life, Peter, sorry, Peter says the key to a godly life is the intimate relational knowledge, that epigenosis, that full knowledge. That full knowledge. And Paul says here, and Peter says here in verse 3, that epigenosis is the goal of the process of spiritual growth. So yes, you can know facts about God, just regular gnosis. But that epignosis, adding that preposition uh, on this, is a deep relational understanding and the experience of God. It's more than just knowing attributes about him or truths about him. This full knowledge, this epignosis, is referring to a deep personal interrelational knowledge. So then he goes on to say that, you know, we're participating or we're partakers of the divine nature. This doesn't mean that you somehow become like God, that you become God. It means that our natures are transformed so that we are like God. We are like God. Then he's going to say here, because of this, we are to make every effort or uh, apply all diligence, spudane, all diligence in your faith or to your faith. Now notice, he says, add to your faith. Faith is not one of the virtues that we're to add to our lives. Faith is already that foundation in which everything else is going to be built upon. Now, he's going to give seven virtues. These seven virtues are a sense of completion. Now, these are not stages that you go through once. Uh, we're going to see that there's a logical order to them. These are you go through these all throughout your life, but Paul, at some point, you may be growing more in self-control. Some point, you may be growing more in perseverance, more in godliness, more in brotherly kindness. It's a process. It's a process. And so he goes on to say, add to these. Add to these. Give all diligence. So, here we go. Where are we to add? Where are we to add? He says, in your faith, supply moral excellence. Moral excellence. Good, you're you're adding this goodness to your life. Arates, you're adding this excellence of character. So here at the beginning, right off the bat, your moral excellence, your godly character and knowledge in self-control. And so right off the bat, the emphasis on moral behavior, because those who want to participate and be partakers of the nature of God must turn away from sinful choices. So add to your faith, arbates, moral excellence. And then you add gnosis, knowledge. Now this knowledge is gnosis. This is general knowledge uh, is different than the one up in verse uh, two, where it's epignosis. Epignosis. Gnosis is an understanding of the truth of the faith. 
This is not the full relational knowledge in verses two and three. So to your faith, faith is a grace and peace, brother. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Had some technical difficulties at the beginning, but we're, we're rolling now. We're rolling. Again, hit the like button, share, subscribe. Uh, and if you want to uh, drop a dollar or two uh, to support the ministry, it will be greatly, uh, greatly appreciated. So we're adding to our faith. Faith is the foundation, and we're adding to the faith. Now, these are virtues that we're adding. These are not stages that you go through once and you're done. These are a cycle, seasons. You're going through these. And at some different points in your life, you're going to be focusing on more, uh, more or less on some of these than others. So we add to our faith, our taste. We add moral excellence, character. There's a goodness here, an excellence of character. Christians are to be. Christians should be some of the most high character people there are. High character. Then you add knowledge, gnosis. You're understanding the truths of the faith. Then to your knowledge, you're adding hupomone. Hupomone. Mones uh, is, is the nominative. Mone is the accusative. So you're adding to your knowledge Hupomone, self-control, to remain under. Self-control is the discipline to be able to. So we're dealing with self-control right now. This virtue of self-control is the Greek hupomone. It's the Greek word hupo mone. This is the discipline to restrain your desires and follow through on doing what is right, even when it is difficult. You're, you're resisting. You're, there's discipline here. Even when it's difficult. Then add to that. No, I'm sorry. Add to self control is egg kratias. Egg kratias. You're, 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 you're controlling or ruling yourself. Perseverance is uh, hupo mone. Perseverance is hupo mone. And that's the ability to continue moving forward or standing your ground. Despite the suffering and the opposition. So you add to egg kratias. You, you add to your controlling of yourself, self-rule. You add to that perseverance to remain under. You're remaining the same while things are being pressed down on you. It's difficult. You're moving forward. But you remain the same. Then you add to that godliness. You add to that godliness. Godliness is doing good deeds toward others. And acts of piety toward God. You're doing good things toward others and acts of piety toward God. Then you add to that. Philadelphia, you add to that mutual affection, brotherly love, brotherly kindness. And then all of these virtues, all of these virtues are now building and adding toward what? Agape. 
all of the virtues, the previous six virtues are building toward the final and the greatest virtue, which is a agape love, a sacrificial, unconditional love. And P Peter says, for if these things, if these things are yours, if these qualities are yours and they are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. Peter goes on to say that the, he's showing us that these are not stages of discipleship. These are a cyclical process where each virtue must continue to grow. So if you feel comfortable uh, in the comments below or in the chat, type which one of these do you think God is trying to increase in your life in this season? Maybe it's one, maybe it's two. But which one can you say that you think God is working on you in in this season in your life? Is it self-control? Is it godliness? Is it perseverance? Is it mutual affection? Is it goodness? Is it moral character? Which of these virtues do you feel that God is carrying you through right now? So Paul says that we are to give, Peter says we are to give all diligence to these things working in partnership with God to add them. And we use these qualities to measure our Christian walk. So he says, if these things are yours and they are abounding, if they are increasing, there is evidence that you are not unfruitful in your knowledge of Jesus. You're not barren. The words barren and unfruitful characterize they characterize the lives of many Christians who lack these qualities because they lack in their knowledge of God. There is no relation relationship. There is no relational increasing to him. They need to abound in us. And then Peter goes on to say, if we lack these things, we have eye trouble. We're short-sighted. We're unable to see God because we only see ourselves. This is powerful. And then he goes on to say, that those, those Christians who stumble at times during the process, the result is not that they lose forgiveness, but that they experience, but their experience and memory of it becomes clouded. Peter says, you're, you're, you're not losing your salvation, but you seem to be, you can't even see where you've come from. powerful. And then he goes on to say here in verse 10 and 11, and we're almost done, that you can make your calling and election sure. This shows us how we can be sure that God has called us and that we are let, are the elect. And that's by doing those things spoken of in 2 Peter 1. And if we see these things in our lives, we're becoming more and like more and more like Jesus Christ. That shows that according to Romans 8 29, we are being conformed to the image of his son. And we're going to get that reward in heaven. That's going to be a day. Perseverance. Perseverance. Hupo mone. So we see that 
we we have the assurance of salvation. Now, assurance of salvation and eternal security are two different things. I'm going to say that again. Assurance of salvation and eternal security Assurance of salvation and eternal security are two different things. Eternal security is the belief that someone is a believer, that if someone is a believer, they cannot lose their salvation. Assurance of salvation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So eternal security is the belief that if someone is a Christian, is a believer, they cannot lose their salvation. So, you know, like John 10, Romans 8, assurance of salvation is the belief that those who are Christians can know that they are. And that's the subject of the epistle of 1 John, is assurance of salvation. Assurance means that you can know that you are saved. That's why 1 John was written. So 2 Peter 2, the text that we're looking at today, does not address eternal security. Peter is not saying, Peter is not saying, if you do these things, you will never lose your salvation. That's not what Peter is saying. Peter is saying, if you're doing these things and you see them growing in your life, yes, sir, confidence, confidence. If you, Peter says, if you see these things in your life, if you see, oh man, I'm I'm loving my brothers more. I'm being more excellent in my character. I'm enduring hardships. Peter says those things, he's talking about assurance of salvation. They're present and they are increasing. If they are increasing, He's saying you can be sure that you have been called by God to salvation. So the emphasis on good works and godly character, giving assurance of salvation, is is consistent with other sections of Scripture. Matthew 7, 15 through 20, Galatians 5, James 2. So this means that the assurance is this means of assurance is complemented by that inner witness of the Holy Spirit who testifies of the reality of your faith in Christ. And then you persevere until the end. So what he is saying is. You do these things. They're increasing in your life. You're becoming more and more like Christ. You can have the confidence, the assurance that you are saved. So we we can grow spiritually here. We can grow spiritually. And the thing is, we don't have to rush. You don't have to rush through this process. We can let God and the Holy Spirit work all of these through in us. Take our time becoming more and more like Christ. So this is just a brief introduction into this new epistle that we're studying, 2 Peter. We just covered the first 11 verses. We're going to pick up on uh, 12 through 21 in the next video in this series. So I pray that this has been a blessing to you guys. Hit hit the like button, share, subscribe, uh, answer the poll question. That helps a lot as well. And again, if you want to support the ministry, uh, 
the cash app is there dollar sign uh rev cockerel if you want to bless the ministry if this teaching has been a blessing to you at all so this is rev c saying god bless you god keep you uh today and whenever you watch this video meditate on second peter 1 and those virtues that you can be adding and increasing in in your life. God bless you. God keep you. Stay in the word.